what we are going to be talking about today is really simple. Um, it is about the fact that meeting spaces need to evolve to become more natural and uh, more organic. Um, in order to discuss this, we have an extremely competent panel, uh, people from all parts of the AV industry. Um, we have Mara from uh, GVM, we have Andy from QSIS, Matthew from JLL, and Naveen from Sennheiser. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time today. I am going to jump uh, right into it uh, with the first question. Now, everyone wants to be seen and everyone wants to be heard. This had been the refrain of the AV industry for a very long time when it came to meeting spaces. Um, I think we are well beyond that right now. I think being seen and being heard is the bare minimum when it comes to the end user's perspective. And uh, personally, I feel that they want more. Um, Matthew, how do you think the end user's demands are evolving beyond being seen and being heard when it comes to the meeting spaces? Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, H, thanks very much. Um, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's obvious that the um, the demands on meeting spaces these days has has evolved a lot in you know the last couple of years. Um, obviously, going through the pandemic and everyone coming out of that um, and realizing that working in the office, working from home, working in the third place actually becomes a very relevant part of how um, you know, modern workforce is operating. So from that perspective, you really do have to, um, if you're going to encourage people to come back to the office to to collaborate, then the office space itself has to be able to work hard. Uh, and when I say work hard, I mean become relatively frictionless for the end users. So when you, if you are coming into the office, a single touch or uh, low low amount of touches to get the a meeting set up and operational. Uh, if you do have participants who are remote, then they are given a reasonable amount of equity within that meeting space. So having um, you know the the leading edge technology that can allow for um, sort of that high fidelity experiences that you can get with you know very robust um, sound systems and and video systems, uh, so that when uh, participants are, are speaking, then uh, you know you're you're getting the best experience possible. In addition to that, obviously the physical space needs to be crafted in a way that performs uh, to the highest um, possible specification as well, from from the lighting to the acoustics of the room, etc. So all of those things need to come together to create a um, you know sort of that that immersive experience. Uh, and I know that some of the panelists that uh, we have here talking with us today have got some of the, the best technology to, to really leverage um, that from a, you know, uh, from a, an experience point of view. And I think, so for me, it's really making the, the meeting space as frictionless as possible so that um, when you're operating within that environment, that it's performing to the highest um, possible uh, level that the, the tools that are used are delivering that high fidelity experience. And then also, and we're going to probably come on to this a little bit later on in the um, uh, in, in the session today, that the, the technologies need to be able to support the users from that collaboration and um, interactivity perspective. Um, you know, so I know that, you know, when we, we're going to no doubt talk about AI, I don't think we can have any technology discussion these days without talking about um, generative um, responses from chat GPT, et cetera. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a lot to be um, taken from that. And, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of that coming out in the very near future. So for that, that's, you know, from my perspective, uh, how I think it should be. Uh, Mara, I want to pose the same question to you, but perhaps from a little bit of a different angle, right? Uh, seeing that GVM is a very well-respected and well-reputed integrator. Um, is it are you able to reliably deliver the fact that everyone can be seen and everyone can be heard? And if so, what are the next set of requirements or requests coming to you from your clients? Uh, Mara, I think you're muted. 
<laughs> there we go. <laughs> Need yeah. to be heard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, automation and integrations per um systems integrations perspective, we are into like uh that's right, according to Matthew. It's the more into users friendly. Uh it's more into like uh, innovations because at the moment there's a lot of like end users that they do have a lot of facets or they do have a lot of perspectives that we also need to consider when it comes to integration when it comes to their needs to their uh, requirements and to their budgets as well but yeah on the other hand we also need to do like uh, more into innovative more into like the focusing on the perspective of the end users hmm. um andy right some good feedback right matthew's talking about frictionless and hmm. mara's talking about the fact that hey end user perspectives need to be focused on right let's talk roadmaps are you is QSA still like hey you know there's incremental benefit into focusing on making people being heard and being seen or are you looking at it as like that stuff's been done. We need to look at what comes next. No, yeah, I mean, it, I think it is worth just not skipping over the audio and video part because to be seen and heard is absolutely vital. You know, this is two of the five senses that we have humans to to connect. And uh, and I've certainly seen studies where it can, it's proven, you know, businesses, if their uh, business communication is poor or really difficult, you know, really money is involved, you know, people are not going to be have profitable businesses if their communication sort of uh, facilities are not really uh, up to scratch. So we certainly, uh, you know, being part of the AV industry, let's not um, downplay the AV side of it. Uh, we should, uh, we, this, this part of the solution is incredibly important. Uh, and it shouldn't just be, oh, I'll just throw in a cheap loudspeaker here. You know, uh, it's, it's in the title of our business, audio video. So let's, let's do it well because it has real intrinsic value. But, but you're right in saying, you know, customers want to do more. You know, they, uh, and I think the genesis of that is they see it. Uh, all around in their consumer space, you know, um, they, you know, you go to YouTube and you see amazing production values, even from a small independent creator, um, you know, with a face tracking on your phone or slide your phone into a dock and it will track you around all these things people see in, in their everyday uh, technology. And I think the same will be uh, with uh, with AI assisting uh, assistance, you know, we're used to now. Uh, open up chat GPT, ask it a question, it gives us an answer. So I think it's going to be a natural evolution that our uh, end users uh, will want this from their meeting spaces. And I kind of want to touch, uh, so yes, they, they'll want to do more in their meeting spaces with the things they see uh, every day around in their technology. But I do want to come back to what Matthew said is that this, uh, what we call meeting equity or in the higher ed space, learning equity is so vital because it's great for the people in the room to have a wonderful experience, but it's equally, if not more important for the remote participants as well, because uh, they're at a natural disadvantage. So. They want to know who's talking, what's going on, is there a discussion, what are they pointing at, what are they writing on a board. So these things are super uh, important. Uh, so yes, um, uh, we need to ensure meeting equity, learning equity, and I think there's going to be this natural expectation uh, for people to want to do more in their spaces. And I think in the next follow-up questions, we'll sort of I'll tell you, share a little bit about how QSIS sees that and how we uh, hope to achieve it. So. Thanks, Hedge. Uh, Naveen, uh, same question over to you. What's the Sennheiser roadmap looking like? I know you guys are one of the foremost experts in making sure people are heard, but what have you? What are you kind of like looking at beyond ensuring that everyone is heard properly? Uh, thank you, Edge, for this uh, lovely opportunity. So if you say user experience every day is getting more and more demanding, I'm also a very demanding user when it comes to uh, the phone which I use, the next laptop which I use. So, and uh, my meeting room also has to be the best. So I always expect it to get better and better. So what are we doing in a meeting room? When uh, earlier I used to enter a meeting room, I used to look at equipments. Where do I see this? Where do I, right now, the equipment is looking for me. So it's so automated so that it looks where I'm sitting. I don't need to be bothered 
uh, I can just have a natural seamless conversation. So if you see many of the places, uh, or, you know, I can tell you an extension. Uh, today, cars have become so much, uh, you know, we spend so much time in cars. Sennheiser is also working on making your car into a nice meeting room with the Ambio technology. So that's something which uh, we are working on. And the common question that comes up always is what's new from the brand? What's new? So that's something which is always, you know, an ongoing question. So this is where we are working on. Yeah, thank you so much, Naveen. Um, Matthew, I just would be remiss if I didn't ask you, right? The question was, our headline is making meetings more natural, more organic, right? Obviously, being seen and being heard is the most important thing. But if you ask me what is organic, what is natural to me, right? Uh, I don't like to sit and talk. I like to stand up. I like to move around, right? And that's how people communicate quite a lot, right? On the phone, you're not really stationary. And I feel that this movement is one of the more natural and organic things that might need to be incorporated in meetings, seeing that, you know, we're taking so many meetings. Any thoughts on that? Anything JLL is seeing in terms of like, hey, meeting spaces need to get bigger because people aren't just going to be seated or in terms of, hey, we need to make sure that we have the right kind of equipment to ensure that if people are walking around, they're still being heard and being seen. Yeah, actually, we're doing quite a lot of work uh, on this particular subject. Um, mm. Interestingly, within JLL, in some of the research teams, we're, we're looking at how people interact in spaces uh, mm. and are most productive. So, you know, I think everyone's kind of aware that um, with the work from home phenomenon, uh, productivity has been reported to increase um, quite dramatically. Uh, however, contrary to that, creativity has somehow mm. taken had a bit of an impact. Um, so, and that's probably down to the fact that we're not getting as much face time with each other as we have done in the past. Um, so, one of the key things that um, JLL is actually looking at is how do we, as individuals, respond to spaces based on all sorts of metrics of how that space is is um, laid out, whether it's the the colors and the furniture or the technology that we're using. Uh, and actually technology becomes quite high on the agenda because the frustration levels, if it's not working for you <laughs> or it's not delivering um, the promise, then that can really impact on how productive and, and creative you are. So, you know, the research team that, that, uh, that we have here are actually looking into how as individuals we're gonna be responding to the spaces and they're finding that each of us responds slightly differently. So one of the one of the key points of understanding around that, that means that the meeting spaces need to be very adaptable. So that if you are the type of person that needs a very formal meeting space, then it, it needs to perform in a certain way, then that's uh, what, what the meeting room has to do when you walk into it. Your colleague, on the other hand, uh, may need it to be a lot more flexible and push the desk to one side and, you know, function in a, in a different way. So by virtue... Um, the meeting spaces have to be very adaptable. And, and again, I think technology is the backbone of, of facilitating that flexibility. Uh, and we are seeing that come through with, particularly with our, you know, the, the interior design theme that we have here, our experts in how to lay out the spaces and plan them, are really leveraging um, the, this inside knowledge that we're getting from how people are, are responding to the spaces when they're actually in, in the room, as well as using the technology. Hmm. That's that's very interesting. Um, Mara, I would like to kind of get you to continue the conversation, right? Uh, Matthew pointed out that spaces need to be adaptable in order to meet the different uses that that and, and, and how they want to use these meeting spaces. Um, how do you think meeting rooms and the technology we use in meeting rooms and meeting spaces needs to evolve in order to, you know, continue serving these users who want everything to be more organic, more natural, more in line with what they like and what they experience in their lives. Yeah, Matthew is right. Um, in addition to that, we also need to uh, double check the flexibility of the uh, environment or of, of the conference room, especially when it comes to their like lighting, their audio, their video. It has to be integrated as well. So mm -hmm. we need to educate our end users as well. So, okay, what are some of the variants or some of the difference that we can improve or what are some of the um, new uh, technologies that we could help them to 
implement in their uh, office or their facilities. So there's a lot of um, facets that we can actually uh, tell them. And then for our perspective, we educate them, tell them we should put something like this. We should put um, this specific product like QCIS. We can put uh, Sennheiser um, microphone and put like QSC speakers over here so we can um, help them do innovations and focus on their um, technologies and advance of our uh, of the innovations right now. Excellent. Um, Naveen, I know the idea of people moving around is something Sennheiser has been focused on for a very long time because microphones, right, is one of those things of directionality, speaking to the microphone, but nah, users don't always follow good microphone etiquette. Um, and then in general, right, um, both uh, Mara and Matthew talked about, uh, you know, flexibility and, and following the user. Um, what are your thoughts on how meeting spaces and the technology that Sennheiser provides need to evolve to continue meeting the needs of users? Yeah, if you see uh, the systems we design or the microphones, what, what we have are so intelligent, it's a true plug and play. So once you do that, you don't need to look back and the microphone will look for you saying that, okay, where is this voice coming and dynamically steering towards you and making sure you're completely heard on the other side or in the same room. So it's a true plug and play. It's scalable. So when you buy a hardware, any, any new feature that comes up in the future, so you with a software update, you can just, uh, you know, enhance the uh, microphone capabilities. Very reliable. So I would say one of the most reliable, uh, you know, uh, product companies when it comes to, you know, solutions, very sustainable. So days are gone when you're using too many batteries, too many this thing. So everything is uh, sustainable. So th these are things which makes us uh, stand apart. Andy, um, flexibility, adaptability, uh, that has yeah. always come with a price tag. Uh, <laughs> price tag gone down or... <laughs> Hey, you know, if you want more DSP channels, you got to pay a little bit of money. No, I think in terms of modern needs of end users, uh, um, I think I'm actually really happy to have this conversation so far and we haven't had an AV IT discussion because <laughs> really, really, we are just in an age of technology now, you know, yes. uh, and frankly, if your solution isn't sort of IT centric from it, it, in its very core, you, you, you know, you probably have a limited uh, lifespan in, in this game. But so, you know, we always designed and evolved QSYS to be at the heart. And if, if, if any of you are not aware of QSYS, we're a sort of uh, a, a audio video and control sort of uh, platform so we our role and what our end users are demanding is that we're, we're not a little island anymore we have to be part of a system of systems so you know end users uh, are using one or more uc platforms um, obviously uh, we as qsys don't make every device in the world so we have to interact with other devices and then have several people have talked about, you know, the actual environmental uh, aspects of the room. So we need to know what's going on, the temperature of the room, the lighting, people are moving around, we want to know about that. And of course, end users want to monitor their investment, you know, so uh, we've got to be monitored in exactly the same way they monitor any of the systems that exist in a, in a, in a facility. And of course, if we're layering, layering in sort of the expectation of uh, AI assisted meetings, you know, I want to see this this on this display, show me this data on that display. These kind of things will start uh, to just be an expectation. So for us at QSIS, uh, we really see uh, QSIS being your AV part, but more importantly, we're a part of a system of systems. And, mm -hmm. and I think we really, uh, maybe traditionally our, our integration partners have done an amazing job pulling together things to work cohesively. But I think these days, especially for us offering a platform, we're, we're looking to take that heavy lift a little bit away from the integration partners. Firstly, with our scope of solution. So uh, there's no need to worry about integrating 
us with X or something like, because we have it already. And that takes the worry both from the integrator and from the end user that will it work? Will it continue to be supported? Uh, and then we'd love to free our integrators up to really uh, concentrate on what they do best, which is hearing their customer's experience and delivering on that experience and not tearing their hair out, making system A work with system B or system A work with device X. Uh, so really, that's how we see a little bit of uh, the demands of our end users for um, an AV platform like QSIS and how then we work with our integration partners and then how we forge uh, really tight integrations with uh, device partners like Sennheiser and, and the like. Hmm. Um, Mara, uh, Andy said that he wants to take a little bit of the heavy lift of the integration <laughs> off your Hands, uh, would you like to... In a good way. <laughs> agree, agree or disagree with that statement? Has it become easier to kind of create these systems? Are they getting a bit more plug and play like Naveen ha had said? Or do you find that there's still more work that needs to be done to make sure that everything comes together as a coherent one single system? Yep. What Adi is saying is definitely outstanding. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We actually need to consider all of those. And also, uh, actually in our building, we're using QCIS. So I find them also <laughs> superb when it comes to their uh, technologies. I also like their uh, user friendliness for their equipment. So yeah, those things, yeah, we need to take note all of that. So to all of our uh, listeners and viewers, we need to consider QCIS as well when it comes when it comes to <laughs> AV. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a glowing recommendation. Um, Navi, um, Andy also mentioned partnerships, right? Like he he meant, he he talked about, hey, we've got to reach across the aisle. There is no mm -hmm. single manufacturer out there that makes every single product that goes into a meeting room, right? You, at some point in time, you're going to have to put one and two together, right? Um, What's Sennheiser's take on partnerships? Uh, what are you guys doing uh, in order to reach across and and work with other manufacturers in the same meeting space? Yeah, uh, you know, today it's no more collaboration happening at uh, a product level. It is much beyond at a manufacturer level where uh, uh, we have a dedicated team globally working on this. So we have multiple partners. We test their equipments. We ensure that there are a lot of native plugins. So it, like I mentioned again, it's a true plug and play, and all uh, agnostic brand partners working together. So this brings us a lot of uh, seamless experience when it comes to uh, giving the end user a great experience. So we have a team which is focused on uh, such collaboration. So they they do do it at a global level, and then we. Uh, work at a local level to integrate the whole thing. Like with QSIS, we do it uh, very often with the other agnostic brands also. Hmm. Um, Matthew, there's an interesting uh, question from our audience, um, which is kind of relevant to the topic. We're talking about how all these different uh, components from different manufacturers need to come together and work as a single whole. Um, Reporting is obviously really important. We need to get data and metrics out of all the products that we have been using. And one of the key trends at ISC was everyone has their own dashboard. Everyone has their own reporting, right? Like I'm sure QSIS has its own reporting. I'm sure Sennheiser has its own reporting. They want to get this data into the hands of the users. However, the user ends up with six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 dashboards. Um, the question is asking, um, can JLL put all of this together in one single dashboard to ensure <laughs> get your ROI? Is that this something is... that JLL is taking on board? Or do you know of any option in the market that collates all this data and brings it into yeah. one? Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. And interestingly, this morning we had uh, a town hall and our global CEO was here uh, presenting to us. And he said when he first started at, at JLL, there were over 400 different platforms that JLL used internally. Wow. <laughs> and trying to get any kind of consolidated data was an absolute nightmare. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously over the over the years, they've been working hard to try and streamline that as much as possible. But it, but of course, we operate in very complex worlds. Uh, you know, the real estate industry is very complex and, and you know, the AV uh, IT industry is no different. It's actually part of that ecosystem. So the number of of uh, different systems that are out there um, that that 
collect data and, and report data in all sorts of different ways is, is actually quite vast. Um, so I think this is actually an area where the uh, machine learning and the AI um, tools that are coming online have a real opportunity to stand up and really make a difference in being able to consolidate um, and present the data in a meaningful way. Uh, so you can imagine if you've got, you know, even just a hundred systems that you have to try and collect data from and, and you're trying to consolidate that on a, on a spreadsheet, it's just, you know, it's, it's impossible to do it with any, with any kind of um, conviction. Um, mm. So yeah, look, it's something that, that's very, uh, that we are focusing on. Um, you know, and I, and I have had some uh, interactions recently with with um, some guys that are building some platforms that are collecting a lot of data from a lot of disparate um, you know uh, sources and being able to present that uh, to end users. Um, so look, it's it's something that I think is going to be uh, become a lot more focused on because the the real estate heads all want to understand how their spaces are being used. How you know how when are they being used at, across the course of a week? How often? How many people? How much of the uh, collaboration tools are being used with remote participants? Are they remote participants who are within the organization, or are they you know external third parties? All of that type of stuff needs to be um, you know collected and, and calibrated. So yeah, hopefully we're going to see a lot more in this space going forward. Uh, Mara. Data is obviously very important to an integrator as well, right? Especially if you've got an SLA or a managed services contract, right? Like you want to be looking at this data. And number two, you want to be looking at this data to better advise your clients, right? Like if they only invested in one meeting room and it is being overused, you want to have data to show them, hey, you should get a second meeting room because your one meeting room is being overused. Are you getting access to this data? What's happening? Do you have do you have the same problem of like we have 100 different sources of data and then we need to bring it all together and make it make sense? What is your experience like? Yeah. In my perspective, this is what we call like upselling, right? Mm -hmm. So we already implemented in one room. So oh, it, oh, so you guys only have one room in your conference room? I think we better create another room for you guys. So we can do all the um proposals for them we can do all the we need to list down all the bill of materials for them to at least educate them what's the new uh products at the moment when it comes to av and to upsell them of course when it comes to new technologies at the same time there's a lot of consideration as well when it comes to um systems integration uh, the budget, of course, the brands that we're going to put in, uh, the people that's going to use the conference room. So those are all the aspects that we need to highlight to our end users. But for me, the very important is to uh, let them know all the AV technologies, to educate them, to upsell, of course, when it comes to sales perspective, and to give them more knowledgeable when it's got knowledge they should be more knowledgeable when it comes to all of these new technologies at the moment. Uh, uh, Andy and Naveen, there's a pointed question uh, to his, both of you on the topic of data and which is, uh, could you help by providing more standardized aligned naming conventions in line with, uh, with industry standards? This isn't a topic that I'm very familiar with, but I think there are going on the fact that, hey, there are broader smart building systems that are already out there that are using naming conventions and, and how to label things. Um, is there any thought that is being given to that? Or are we still in at, at the point of like, hey, we need to first consolidate ourselves and get all of AV on one board. And then we can talk about how we're going to interface with HVAC and how we're going to interface with smarter building systems. Yeah, we've been um, uh, we've had QSIS Reflect, which is our remote management and monitoring uh, tool. And there's a few aspects to that which hark back to my as an AV platform. We want to, we need to be part of a system of systems. So certainly, yes, we have our own dashboard. Uh, and actually, a step before that, uh, we aggregate. So not only do we monitor our own devices, but for example, if you're using a Sennheiser microphone and we are doing some control of it with the uh, the um, plug-in from our asset manager for Sennheiser that uh, they have helped develop with us, that the data from the Sennheiser product would flow up 
through the system as well. So we're not just monitoring ourselves, but we are your AV monitoring platform of choice. And then the next step is, yes, you can log into our, our dashboard and see what you like. But we also m made sure that there are dedicated systems that do this. <laughs> so, you know, we have an API. So if you want to integrate it with Splunk or ServiceNow, which are recognized sort of monitoring platforms, uh, we play very friendly with, with, with those. So we try to recognize, again, uh, playing a part of a system of systems in a in a way that everyone expects us to, but then equally sometimes people just want to you know bang open the box, uh, fire up what we offer, and then use that. So we want to uh, play nicely in both in both ways. Um, Naveen, um, perhaps you could elaborate on on Sennheiser's take as well. I'm sure that you guys are quite open as well, and you have APIs that allows Sennheiser data to be incorporated into wider platforms. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, the first step was uh, having control cockpit where all the Sennheiser equipment come on a same platform, which makes it very easy for people to control all the Sennheiser equipments. And then getting into the APIs, which works for our agnostic partners. So that's something which is the next step. And maybe, you know, right now there is something already going on when it comes to uh, external systems like HVAC or security. So, but right no, it's about uh, our internal systems and whatever is like brands like QSIS. So we, we are seamlessly integrating that. Perfect. Um, I think we're getting to the point of discussing uh, the big topic, which is, you know, uh, it's been mentioned once or twice before, uh, generative uh, AI, generative machine learning, right? Whatever you want to call it. But uh, I think we find ourselves very interestingly at a point where a lot of technologies are maturing, right? Uh, we had web 2.0, we had blockchain, now we have generative AI, right? Um, it seems that these things are evolving really quickly and and, and there are so many ideas that they spark. Um, my, my question really is, right? Where, like, could these broader technology developments be leveraged to help make the products that we deliver, right? The systems that we create better. Um, Andy, um, I'd like you to perhaps take this question and talk about how you, QSIS is, you know, uh, looking at these broader technology trends and bringing them into what you guys deliver. Yeah, I, well, I suppose, yeah, change will always change. <laughs> uh, and if anything, change is becoming faster, you know, <laughs> we're in exponential change, you know, go back two <laughs> years, none of us had even worried about AI in our everyday lives. Now it's been everywhere. Uh, yeah. So for us, you know, we see it as incredibly uh, e exciting. And I suppose where maybe AI has has touched us in a practical way is <laughs> our launch of Vision Suite, which is sort of uh, a range of not only QSIS hardware, but matching QSIS technology. Uh, as the name suggests, people need to be seen and heard uh, in, in, a, in a meeting space. So, um, you know, Vision Suite sort of uh, utilizes our existing camera set. So uh, I think to answer a question in the um, in the q and I think from Pete, hi Pete, uh, you know, about, hey, let's not always be banging out new hardware all the time, you know, uh, we've always had a philosophy of uh, doing lots of the smarts in the core technology and not replacing our endpoints all the time. So certainly our um, uh, vision suite technology works with our existing camera set. So you're not always constantly, oh, a new camera's out, got to get that one. Um, but um, but the other thing with sort of this uh, being seen and heard in a meeting space is that there are occasions where you want an audio trigger to tell you where uh, somebody who needs to be seen and heard is. And of course, we could leverage that information from uh, a microphone like Sennheiser, for example. Uh, and there are times where we actually want to track the physical body around the room. Uh, and, and again, there are QSIS technologies for both of those things. The audio trigger is something we call ACPR, Automatic Camera Preset Recall. And on the AI front, we recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, purchased uh, a company called Sea Vision out of Switzerland, who had done lots of the AI uh, presenter tracking. Uh, so we've now integrated that into our QSIS platform. And what, what the beautiful thing is that you, you're not forced to buy it all or less. If, if audio uh, triggering of your camera position is required, 
you can just leverage that technology. If you just want the actual physical tracking of a, a presenter, you can do that or you can do both. Uh, it's really up to you. And the other, as I say, the other thing pointing to, you know, we we don't want to be constantly selling everyone new hardware every 10 seconds. You know, um, this technology we brought to market leverages our standard QSIS NC cameras, which have been out for some time. So we're not trying to push on you a, a new AI camera model and stuff like that. So, so that's some of the th exciting things that we've got coming forward, which I think are levering, leveraging some of the new technology that is coming into uh, uh, our lives. And, and I suppose coming back to the experience, because at the end of the day, people want to have a good experience and connect with other humans. And, and to that aim, we've, uh, we've put a lot of effort into our experience centers, which are coming up all around the world. And in fact, we have one launching in Singapore, but what's really unique about it is it's actually our working office. <laughs> so when you come to see the experience center in Singapore, it is actually what we use day in, day out. So, uh, we're literally, the guys are moving in, uh, sort of over the next course of the next few weeks. So certainly I am hoping in the next month or two, uh, we'd love to invite you to see that if you're in the Asia Pacific area, but we have similar experience centers popping up all over the place. So we want to show you the experience. So let's not get too focused on just technology. At the end of the day, we need to great, make great experiences. Um, Naveen, technology trends, a lot is happening. Um, what is Sennheiser leveraging? How are you kind of like making sure that the next wave of Sennheiser products outperforms the previous versions yeah if you see uh current products and what's going in future uh you know every product is looking at uh you know being automated solution being automated and uh you know most of our products today is ai driven in terms of uh you know be it the dynamic beam forming or the acpr what uh, uh we spoke about and if you see uh, how can we make it more intelligent by eliminating unwanted noise it is only the speech that needs to be picked up these are some things which makes uh, such a seamless experience for the user so he doesn't need to do too much of uh, programming it's it's truly uh, you know an experience which is uh, plug and play hmm. interesting um, um matthew right um how are you conceptualizing all these big technology changes that are happening and that will obviously, you know, filter down into the world of AV as well and impact how our products are built. Um, any ideas, any specific trends? Yeah, but I think there's two key things that I think where, particularly from JLL's perspective, where the, there's some big advances coming. Number one is from when you're collating all of that data, um, there's an element of you know, recording the consumption of, um, you know, energy, whether the, you know, monitoring the temperature of the rooms or, you know, the use of the the equipment, et cetera. So there's definitely a sustainable component to it and using AI to um, give sort of constructive feedback on the, the most efficient way to um, to manage the resources that you've got, uh, depending on the, on the loads that are going through them, you know, through the course of a week or the course of a month. So, you know, leveraging the, um, the the sustainable, sorry, leveraging the technology to get the most sustainable use out of your systems, I think is going to be something that that people focus on. Um, and then from the experience point of view, uh, us, us as individuals, when we come into the room, like I said at the, at the, uh, the beginning of the session, then having a, a frictionless or um, mm. you know less friction kind of experience is going to become quite important as well. And... You know, recently um, being able to test some of the things that Copilot are able to do from Microsoft, where they it's able to basically transcribe a meeting. Uh, it'll give you a set of meeting notes or minutes. It'll assign um, tasks to people that were, um, you know, assigned those tasks during the meeting. You'll get an email uh, with your with the tasks that you've got to do and when you've got to do it by, if you're not not able to attend the meeting, then you, you can send your your AI avatar to be there for you, uh, and you you know and come back to you after the meeting's finished and give you a summary of what happened. And if you need to watch the you know you can rewatch the the, the meeting um, as it unfolded, etc. So having those tools at your fingertips um, is is going to be you know. Uh, 
uh, a very important thing to allow, you know, to encourage us to continue to use the technologies. You know, another thing when we're talking about the audio side of things, it'll if you're in a meeting room uh, and you set the system up, it can detect whether I'm speaking or whether Andy's speaking or whether Naveen is speaking, if we're all in the room together through through mm-hmm. learning what our voices sound like. So even if you're in the room, mm-hmm. uh, it knows who said what um, and who's been assigned what. So I think, you know, that that side of, and it's not just uh, Microsoft that are doing this as well. I know that, you know, um, Google have got um, their products coming out and I'm sure there'll be other products coming out which can really uh, leverage on the whole um, you know, AI side of supporting what we do. And if, you know, I don't think anybody goes into a meeting wanting to be the one who puts their hand up to write the notes and send out <laughs> send out minutes to anybody. So if the AI can take that off our hands, we'll be using it a hell of a lot more, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Um, Mara, um, what are you seeing? Um, there's actually a question about, you know, concierge services for meeting rooms, you know, things like, I want to book a meeting room, I want a little bit of support during my meeting room, how do I start this, how do I do this? Do you maybe foresee AI stepping in and taking this job over from like, you know, operational support, things that are like really easy, really templated, right? Like, do you think AI can have an impact there? How do you kind of see using AI for your clients? Yeah, AI actually is a very good, um, has a very good impact when it comes to emerging innovations. Number one, we need to consider the technologies, emerging technologies, the voice control activation, the environment of that conference room, even biometric um, integration is also part of that. So into end users perspective, when it comes to like um, going into the room, one of the example of the equipment itself should be like a booking system. They maybe have like an iPad when they're going into the conference room. They even can book a uh, pre-booking when it comes to, they can put the timing for that. When they ca- uh, came in to the room, the light will automatically switch on. Mm. Okay, when they sit down, aircon should be automatically on. And then the TV will be automatically on as well. So the conference room is like, it's so easy for them to, to just start the meeting when it comes to you know this AI it's actually a very good um, idea when it comes to technology. It helps a uh, human to make our lives more easy. Excellent. Um, Naveen, um, the last question on AI to you. Um, we've had AI assistants somewhat in the form of Siri and, 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 and Google has a version and Amazon has a version, Alexa, right? They've all existed, right? And they've always been voice activated. Uh, it's just that there's microphones on our phones aren't really that good is is that something that that you guys are 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 considering at sennheiser that maybe perhaps all these ai concierge services that are being developed right voice activation voice commands might actually become really important and that might mean that you know we need to tailor our microphones a bit more to like speech and things like that what are your thoughts in terms of how this ai assistant thing is going to play out and whether or not that will have an impact on how Sennheiser develops products. Yeah, currently, if you see, uh, you know, all the voice activation is happening at a local level, it's still not integrated into any of these uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is at a microphone level as of now, and then gets into the, you know, uh, the DSPs and the others, but nothing in terms of, uh, you know, integration to any other platforms as of now, but definitely there would be something that's worked on. Excellent. Um, That brings us to the end of our structured discussion for the panel. Uh, We will now be focusing primarily on the questions that you guys are sending across. Uh, We have addressed some of them during the course of the conversation, but if you have more questions, uh, please keep them coming. Um, Gentlemen and ladies, uh, one of the major questions that has come across has been sustainability, right? Do you have a sustainability product roadmap? How do we bring, you know, carbonization levels down for meeting rooms? How can we make sure that products are more green, right? Uh, What are your ESG efforts? All of these questions have been posed. Um, Andy, you know, what (laughs) is this take on on sustainability? 
Yeah, we we have uh, obviously uh, a whole kind of department that's sort of working on it, but it, it also it, it is also a huge huge topic. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yes, we we uh, and we try and keep people up to date, you know, via the dedicated page on our website. Uh, it's an ongoing process for us. It's obviously at the heart of what we do. Um, I, look, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but yeah, we uh, w certainly in the last year or two, that department has beefed up with people. You know, it used to be a shared responsibility of somebody else, but it's too important now. So we have dedicated people in this area that work on it constantly. And as I say, it touches pretty much every area of what you do as a manufacturer. Uh, so it's it's a huge topic, but yeah, one that is incredibly important to us. Uh, and, I, and as I said before, I think the way we go about our technology is, is um, you know, we try and leverage uh, software more than sort of hardware as such, although we do sell hardware, which naturally has a, uh, an e-waste component to it. Uh, but we try and make people uh, uh, be able to use their hardware investments uh, for as long as possible. Um, Naveen? Um, could you shed light on the sustainability efforts of, of Sennheiser and what you guys are doing uh, to go green? Yeah, uh, Sennheiser has a huge, uh, you know, I would say responsibility that's put into this division. Like Andy was mentioning, we also have a team which is exclusively working on such initiatives from the time of sourcing of uh, components mm -hmm. and then uh, from the production using as much as solar power as possible. Uh, and then looking at the supply chain, including our packaging so to make it as sustainable as possible. So it's not just in one component, it's everything from the sourcing to the end user. So everything uh, you know, has to be sustain sustainable. That's the whole initiative. Uh, Matthew, when it comes to real estate, right? The conversation around green has always been about energy conservation because that has a direct impact on the bottom line, right? Like if you're using less electricity, you're spending less money, that's good. I can go green and I can also, you know, spend less money. Brilliant. Win win. Um, has that conversation progressed? I am assuming it has. Are you seeing yeah. people come up and be a bit more like, hey, you know, real estate needs to be green and we need to move the conversation past just an energy conservation? Yeah, it's actually a, it's a big it's you know, as Andy said, it's a huge topic and it, it's a very important one uh, from JLL's point of view. Um, you know, everything we do centers around um, what the impact of um, you know anything that we're doing has on on the uh, on the environment and you know a lot of our clients also sort of demand um, as, as you know sustainable decision making around you know the, the, their real estate decisions as, as much as possible um, and you know we have programs in-house where um, whether it's technology or, or other bits of equipment can be um, collected, repurposed, uh, reused in other, in other places or given, you know, a new lease of life for the same client to extend um, the time that they can use that. Uh, I, you know, I think it's one of those things that we all have to be very conscious of um, and try as, as much as possible to reduce our, um, our carbon footprint. And in fact, if, the meeting rooms and the video conferencing platforms that, that we're using perform to a high level, then we won't jump on a plane as often as possible. We won't drive an hour into work all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, all of those types of things, we'll be leveraging the tools that we've got. Um, and, and, you know, by virtue of, of that, you know, we'll contribute to, to reducing the overall impact um, that, we're, that we're having. But yeah, it's a massive top topic. And I think we could have a whole uh, another yeah. hour's discussion around what <laughs> what initiatives we can do for, um, yeah. for, for yeah. sustainability. Um, Mara, I have a specific question on sustainability for you, right? Um, at the stage we are in right now, right? Generally, green products are a little bit more expensive than products that are not perhaps being as sustainable, right? I don't want you to name any names. I don't want you to talk about your clients. But when you are talking to them and you're presenting green options, are you seeing maybe a shift in the... In, in, in how the clients are perceiving? Are they a bit more willing to spend a little bit extra to make sure that, you know, their own ESG sustainability efforts are being met, that their own, like, you know, green initiatives are being met? Uh, what are you seeing from your clients? Is there more appetite to be able to be like, yes, I'm willing to go that extra step to be green? 
um my perspective when it comes to sustainability we need to like just educate them let them know the advantage and disadvantages uh it has to be yes natural resources from all of the uh things or all of the um uh equipment or all of the interior that's happening inside the conference room we just need to let them know let them aware that oh this thing can make you guys uh save more and then we also need to tell them that we need some uh improvement to help uh like system something like that we need to tell them all the um because right now it's like global warming so we need to like educate them let them know uh, we need to help you we need to help each other when it comes to uh sustainability and help our help the world actually that's how our that's manage or that's how we uh deal with sustainability when it comes to business yeah 100 percent. i believe that the consumer is changing as well right like as the younger consumers grow in buying power right i have a feeling that they're going to be a bit more insistent on having sustainable products um yeah. andy um you have uh kind of indicated that you would like to answer pete's question about decarbonization is that oh something- I, I i hope i kind of answered it I, I look but yeah as i i think i've repeated myself but yeah we 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 try and help you get the best out of your your hardware purchase by uh you know doing a lot of feature development within the core processing and and updating uh the software side and not necessarily um putting all the smarts in the hardware at the end device uh so so you know i i think i was trying to address that uh, question that pete had in in that in that regard but yeah it's a, um so yeah i think i think we have talked about yeah i mean get, start repeating <laughs> um there is a cheeky little question here for you uh andy that's asking hey can ai help me program my ds <laughs> right Hey, look, um, yeah, I'm sure, you know, like, I mean, flip people are coding with AI. So, um, uh, you know, and, and for those of you who don't know, uh, certainly uh, we have our own design software. Uh, but uh, if you want to get a little bit more uh, in, in depth and new, do more bespoke customizations, we use a language called Lua. And there's no reason why you couldn't leverage ChatGPT to write your Lua for you. You might need to adapt it a little bit to work with us. But yeah, I, I mean, doing the drag and drop sort of programming side, um, I'm not sure yet. But yeah, I think anything is possible. So, I mean, we help try and get people. I mean, the beauty of QSIS is uh, it's simple to use, but it's also infinitely scalable or adaptable. You know, so we try and get that balance of uh, being plug and play while at the same time retaining uh, the ability for our integration partners like GVM really to tailor a solution for their customers, which is really uh, important. And that helps. Um, that helps distinguish you from different integrators as well, if you know what I mean. But of course, you know, there is a big, big uh, play as well in more sort of maybe hang and bang spaces where we can help play a role. They're different kind of businesses. We want to support them both. Uh, but yeah, uh, sort of uh, not yet, but I think anything is possible. Um, Naveen, any uh, chance AI can help setting up Sennheiser products and and tuning them? Or do you think that that will still require an expert, a human expert to come and and, and make sure that these microphones are working properly? Yeah, I I think it's still not that stage where we can completely automate everything Mm -hmm. right now. So we we need a little bit of intelligence, human intelligence still required. Mm -hmm. Um, Matthew, uh, there are some questions about hey, if all these repetitive tasks are kind of going to go towards AI, is, what's that going to mean for for human capital, <laughs> right? Like, what's that going to mean for talent, which is a better word than human capital? Um, what are your thoughts in terms of like, hey, you know, just because this is showing up and it doesn't necessarily mean that the human element or the human touch is going to become redundant? Yeah, I look, personally, I think that the AI is, is it's a tool like a calculator was a tool, um, like the computer was a tool. So I, I think the the threat to people's um, jobs is the ones who aren't embracing AI are the ones who are going to get left behind. 
Um, I don't, but I, I, you know, I think with all technologies that we've seen over the, you know, over the millennia, um, it always sort of creates more, more jobs um, than, than it takes away. Of course, there, there will be a recalibration and the people who don't embrace the new tech technology may well be uh, left behind to a certain extent. Uh, but overall, I think if you, if you invest some time and understand what the tools are capable of doing, uh, then, you know, you'll be best suited to, to continue to perform uh, within, you know, within, within the workforce and, um, you know, probably get more out of what you, you know, I think the AI, like I say, is it's a tool that mm. you can, you can leverage to improve what you do, uh, streamline some of the, the more mundane things. Uh, Mara, there's a question here talking about is sustainability a part of how you formulate a tender? for a project. Um, I know that this is going to be very specific to your region, right? And based on whatever the building codes for sustainability and green initiatives are, but if you could perhaps shed some light on how you think about sustainability when you're creating a tender for a project. Yeah. Uh, so actually right now, society is more into AI. <laughs> so they want more like, you know, they want everything like auto on, auto off, so it's, mm. it's one of the things that we need to consider when it comes to this uh, kind of sustainability. And on top of that, we also need to like uh, create the bill of materials or create the, uh, we need to formulate all of those things to come into one solutions for our end users. So for me, one of the sustainability that I need to consider would be uh, ecosystem and what I call is like power saving something. So it's more easy for us to uh, let them know that, oh, these things can uh, auto on and auto off for you. So we can help save energy. So yeah, those are the things that we need to uh, let them know. Yep, I perfectly agree. I feel that energy saving is one of those things that everyone can understand. And then mm -hmm. the rest of it does depend very heavily on the region that you're in and what the building codes are and what the legislation and the regulation are, right? Those things need to be taken into account quite a lot. Um, we are expecting both building codes and regulations to move forward in the future. Um, they are already moving forward in a lot of different regions of the world. So, you know, sustainability, there's a reason why everyone's talking about it. <laughs> it's important because, hey, you need to start considering it now so that when the regulations finally show up, You've already done your groundwork. Um, lady and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Thank you so much to the panelists, all of them, for sharing your thoughts and opinions. Uh, we are at the end of today's webinar. Um, it has been, the R has really gone by very, very quickly. I have no idea. I thought we started. Um, but yes, once again, panelists, uh, thank you so much. Uh, to our attendees, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we will be back in the future with another panel like this, discussing another topic of interest to the AV industry. So catch us next time. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.